uh, sorry, I've, I've effectively by network databasing, I mean that I'm going to have some way that I can keep all the coverage, all the statistics, and all the inputs uh, kind of in one central location, have everything collaborating uh, and building onto each other. So yeah, that's effectively the trick there. Um, so fuzzing multiple things in different machines and syncing up to one central DB? Yep, that's it. That's all it is. <laughs> I don't see why Twitch wouldn't give a wide range of quality options. Anything to lower the bandwidth, you'd think they'd be for that. I think the encoding, yeah, the transcoding is the hard part. Now, I wonder if someone makes, like, FPGAs or PCIe cards that these, like, streaming companies use that makes the transcoding kind of just automatically happen in hardware. I really hope they're not just FFM pegging it. But who knows? They probably are. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I wrote a couple things in the past few days. Um, so there are, I have an atomic vector, uh, which we'll go into, and then I implemented an atomic hash table as well. And these are actually, I, I've used these databases, uh, pretty much ever since I wrote my code in assembly. Even my assembly version has variants of these, um, hash tables. If I look at, uh, Firefox and GitHub... And wherever I have the Fulkervisor beta. So in Fulkervisor beta, I actually have the assembly version of the, I called it FLUT, the, uh, the Fulk lookup table, I think, is what I called it. And this was an atomic operation that took in a hash, and it allowed me to fetch or insert something into a database. Uh, if it existed in that database, um, it returns out the reference to it. If it did not already exist, then it returned me an indicator saying, you currently are responsible for filling this in. So it kind of give you, gives you a handle to the field that you have exclusive access over that you reserved, but you have to fill it in. And the big reason for that, it allows you to lazily fill in an entry because it's way too computationally expensive to end up filling in those tables um, every single time you want to look up an entry. So I wanted a way that it would reuse the same code that looked up an entry and was the getter and also the insert side of things. Um, so I ported that to Rust and I ported it very literally where I returned an, uh, a result where the OK was a reference to the thing and an error was a reference to the thing you had to fill in. And then I realized, well, that's really pointless in Rust. You can actually do that with a... Um, We'll take a look at that. Uh, you can actually just do that with a closure, which makes a lot more sense. So what I did is this is my atomic hash table implementation. And we'll go through a little bit about this. Uh, first of all, this atomic hash table basically allows you to have multiple uh, inserters into a hash table without acquiring a lock. So technically, I would consider these to have locks, but the locks are per entry in the hash table. So as long as you're not having collisions and as, and as long as your hashes are relatively unique, you only pay a lock on each element in the hash table or technically uh, elements that are adjacent to each other in a cache line, but whatever. So this is done. I declare a couple types here. I have this hash table entry. This is what, uh, what an entry in the hash table looks like. It is an atomic pointer to a V, the value of the hash table. And then I have an atomic uninit, which is the key value. So I store the pointer to the value, and then the key value cannot be a dynamically sized thing. Makes sense. And that I say is maybe uninit. That allows me to keep this as uninitialized and kind of speed up some of the allocation and creation uh, of these uh, buffers. Next, I have a hash table. This is, I'm using uh, const generics here because I can, because I'm in nightly, so fuck it. Um, I'm using const generics here to say that a hash table for a given size of entries is just hash table entries as a fixed size array of n entries. Super simple. I then have this concept of an entry. I think we'll come back to this. Um, and this is the atomic hash table itself. So the hash table itself has a key of value and then a, a generic n, which is the size and number of entries for the hash table. And this contains a box, so it's on the heap, and then it has a hash table, which is that it's just a boxed fixed size array. 
Uh, we do not allow regrowing. We don't allow removal. We don't allow any of this. This is an insert only hash table. Um, I then have the number of entries currently present in the table. That means I can run uh, dot len, and I can get the length of number of things added, uh, which is useful to me because that's usually a coverage number or something uh, of a similar effect. So creating the hash table is really easy. I have no constraints on any of the types, the key value or uh, the, the constant n. Uh, technically, um, these are sized, right? They can't be dynamically sized, but that makes sense. So we have a, an atomic hash table here. And in here, I first make sure that the uh, entries in the hash table is a power of 2. And by checking that that's a power of 2 guarantees that I can actually use a, an AND operation. I can use a mask to calculate the index into the hash table. But now I'm realizing, as I'm reading this, that this is kind of pointless with const generics because it's a constant, it's a constant value for the mask. So I might as well just use a, a modulo operand, uh, operation. Because if you have a power of two database, um, then Rust will be able to figure that out. And since this is constant, historically I haven't used a const generic there. Thus, uh, Rust hasn't been able to reason about it at compile time. So it has to just assume it's the worst case divide. Uh, we can actually get rid of that. Um, next we have this layout. So this is going to determine Tell me the size and alignment to make an array of this type, a hash table entry, for n length. So this is giving me kind of that dynamically computed, although this is a static number, which is really cool with const generics. This will just be a, a const propagated number. I then allocate that zeroed out. That means that these atomic pointers are null pointers, and these maybe uninits are still uninit, because k might not be valid to be all, all zeros. Um, but that still may be uninit, so that's fine. Basically, maybe uninit will prevent those from getting dropped. I then make sure the allocation succeeds. If the allocation succeeded, then I make a box from that raw allocation. And that's how I'm able to box up a fixed size uh, array rather than a normal uh, slice. And if I use a fixed size array with const generics, that basically means that all of the length checks that Rust does are a lot easier because it's not a dynamically sized thing that Rust has to reason about in a very complex way at compile time or has to fall back to uh, at runtime. So that's why we're using those. And then I start off, uh, hash table is this box thing we made, and then entries is zero. I have a length getter. This will get the number of entries currently in the hash table. This is a little bit racy. It could lag behind how many are, entries are actually in there, but it'll converge to what's correct, and I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, next, uh, we have the meat of it, which is this entry or insert. And basically, the way entry or insert works is you call this on a table. Once again, not mutable. You don't need a mutable reference, so you can have this table in an arc, and you can share it between all the cores. Um, it takes a key, which is a reference to a queue, it takes a hash, which is a U size. I give you the ability to control the hash, and that allows you to, if you have a hashing algorithm that like is approximate and gets and gets the job done, um, I actually let you provide that hash. It, it makes it so much easier. Um, obviously, this means you can have duplicates of keys in a database. It's on you to make sure that you don't end up colliding those, those hashes. But basically, I give you control of the hash, which is pretty neat. And then on an in, uh, insertion, I have a closure that gets invoked if the entry is not present, in which case the closure gets invoked and that will yield a value. And then at the end, it returns the entry. And that entry, we can now go back to this, the entry contains a reference to the previous value, or a reference to the newly inserted value, or a reference to the old value in the table. All this really does is it wraps a reference with inserted and exists such that I can use these helpers to determine if something was inserted or if something is um, uh, exists. So when I insert something, I can, on the return of that insert, I can say inserted, and that will give me a Boolean of whether I inserted something for the first time. And it will also give me exists, which is the same thing. Did it exist uh, prior? And then I have a dot entry, which will just extract a reference to the thing, in which case you don't care uh, which one it actually is. 
What are the benefits of giving me control of the hash? Well, typically for coverage, I will actually have something that's very hash-like. For example, just PC. The raw PC value is typically a good enough hash. <laughs> or like offset into a module. Typically a good enough hash for what we're doing. By giving you control of the hash, I basically make it so you can be aware of the locality, the caching locality of what you're looking up. So if you're looking up things that are very similar, you can kind of make sure that the cache is hot. If you have an actual hash, the hash should be pretty uniform across the entire hash space. And in that case, you're going to end up in a situation where, um, uh, you'll end up in a situation there where the hashes will basically constantly be missing the, the cache because the lookups into the hash table are going to be basically completely random accesses into this potentially couple hundred meg hash table. Um, so that's basically the thing there. The other thing is computing a hash is expensive. If you already have something that is hash-like, then there's no reason to compute the hash if you can just use an existing value. For example, when I'm doing coverage, I don't need to actually hash the the coverage value itself, I can simply use the PC. That way I don't have to actually compute a hash, which is typically very, very, very expensive. So yeah. Okay. So that gets into kind of the logic of how this entry or insert logic works. Um, once again, you pass in a key, a hash, and then an insertion routine. So the insertion routine yields a boxed value, and that allows you to just return out whatever the thing is um, that you want uh, as your value. And that means that this will lazily get invoked. So if, the, if it's already present in the table, you don't have to uh, create that object. You know, Say you might have to make a string for making a value in this table. This means you can bypass that if it already exists. Um, here we say that the K value, the key value for the hash table itself has to be borrowable as a Q, which is our key. Then we say that Q has to have equality. It has to have a way of turning it into an owned version of the object. And it has to, uh, and it can be um, unsized. And this basically means that the K value for the, um, for the hash table can be a string. But since a string, uh, like an actual string, capital S string, but since that can be borrowed as a ref string, that means that Q, the key, can be an actual string here. And the string, a ref string, um, implements equal. It implements two owned because it can be converted into a string, a capital S string, um, and it's non-sized. And then this is saying the owned version, so what this gets turned into when you two owned it, the owned version of Q has to be convertible into a K. All in all, it's basically saying, make sure that the key, the key can be compared by reference to the existing key in the database. And that means you don't have to make a string if you want to compare a string in the database. But it also means that I can convert this key into an actual key that I can store in my database. That's the logic behind that. So here I compute a mask, and I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm just going to mod this by n. OK. How come the hash is an argument instead of providing a function um, when the table is created, like Rust built-in map types, if, it cus if customizable hash values are important? Uh, with that, you can't. With that, you have to implement a hasher on whatever you're passing in as a key. Um, in the same way, like the same hasher has to be implementable for every type you're you're passing in, and I want the ability to just use whatever type for a hash here that I want. Um, if you use a hasher, you have to have a way that you can convert from your key, your key your Q value into a hash, which we'll just call a U size. And if I have that requirement, that means first of all, I'm gonna have a lot of code bloat because I'm gonna end up implementing hash on so many fucking things all over the place. It's just gonna be a mess. And second of all, um, there are going to be types that I don't want to implement that hash on. I don't want to hash a U64, which is my PC, but I do want to hash a U64, which is maybe some other value, right? Obviously, I could wrap that up in a, in a way like that, but you're going to end up having to strongly type basically anything you ever pass to this, um, and you're going to end up... It, it's just going to... 
you're gonna have massive boilerplate anytime you wanna insert something into a hash table. Um, so to me, this is acceptable. Okay, then I create these two locals uh, representing an empty value in the hash table, which is a null pointer, and then a filling value, which is an entry which has been atomically accessed but has not yet been filled in. Um, in that case, it's just not zero, so it's all Fs as a mutable pointer. So what I do is I go through for a certain number of attempts. Now, if there's a collision in the hash table, I'm actually going to proceed to the next entry in the hash table. And to do that, I need a loop. So that is the outside loop. I also make sure that I don't attempt more times than my n is. If I end up attempting for as many times as there are entries in the database, that means that I didn't find a single slot. There were collisions in every single slot. Every single slot is currently being used, at which point I have to panic because you're out of entries. This is a fixed size table. It cannot grow. So if we hit that stage, uh, we just panic. And I could theoretically return an option there, but I can't think of a, cert a, a single situation where I can handle that cleanly, so I'm fine with a panic here. I then compute the index into the hash table by taking your hash and modding it by the number of entries in the database. That just gives me a unique index into the hash table. And that's where the search for a free entry or a matching entry starts. So then the logic is I look up the entry in the hash table and I get the atomic pointer. I then load that atomic pointer and I check if it's empty. So before I do this uh, atomic compare and swap, which is expensive, I first just load the value. This on x86 is basically free. So I'm just making sure, and pretty much every architecture, this is basically free. So I'm basically making sure that this field is empty. If it's not empty, I can immediately skip doing this compare and swap, which might be a much more expensive operation. So if the entry is empty, meaning no one has claimed that slot yet, then I attempt to get exclusive ownership of that value. Since I haven't created a value yet to put in the hash table, because I'm going to lazily fill it in, I compare and swap it, and I say, if it was empty, replace it with filling atomically. And that's the, the magic all Fs. So all Fs signifies that an entry is currently reserved and some other core or thread on the system is in process of filling that entry in. So someone has locked it, and they're about to fill it in. So then, if it was previously empty, meaning the compare and swap did occur, I know at this point that I have exclusive access to hash table HTI. No one else is currently accessing this, in which case, I then call the insert closure, that's what you pass in, that will lazily evaluate the thing That'll create whatever object, whatever complex value you want to store in the hash table. And then I'm going to convert that into uh, a raw pointer. I'm then going to make sure that that raw pointer did not end up becoming empty, a null pointer, or my filling value, all Fs. And all that's doing is making sure that in some weird way that that pointer did not coerce into one of these things that I expect to be a magic value. It is, so if you do a box... Um, if you box up a, a zero size type, you don't actually get an allocation on the heap. You, the pointer that you actually get from the box is, is one, one hex. It's not null, but it's one. It's, it's just address one. Um, so I, I'm just making sure that if for some reason that isn't stable or guaranteed, I'm making sure that they don't change it to a value that I expect. Uh, that I use internally. So that assertion basically will never get hit, um, but it's a check just in case some internals to Rust change, and maybe they use all Fs instead for a um, zero-size type box. Now that I have the pointer to this newly created thing, um, first I'm going to insert the key. So I'm going to go into the... Um, I'm going to get mutable access to the hash table entry. This is unsafe, of course, because that, that entry I only have uh, immutable reference to, uh, an immutable reference to. But since we guaranteed we have exclusive ownership of this field, um, we can actually fill that in. So we convert that to a mutable pointer, and then we write in the key that we passed in. We convert it to the owned version of the value, which turns it into this. And then we convert that into a K. And all of those traits we, we make sure are implemented. At that point, I've written in the key value for this entry. 
And next, I fill in the entry. So I store the pointer to this entry that I created into the hash table. And at that point, that entry went from filling to a non-empty, non-filling value, which means it is now present. And since we do this after we fill in the key, thus by nature, the key is also valid. So we have, the ordering matters here a lot in that we fill in the key before we fill in this entry. And then at that stage, we update the number of entries. So technically, there's like a small race window here where the number of entries in the database doesn't match exactly how many entries there are. It doesn't matter. It, like that level of detail just doesn't matter. Um, and then I return a reference to this newly created entry and I say that this was inserted because it was. This, uh, I notify the user that they have inserted a new value into the hash table, meaning they were the first one with that key and hash combination. And that's it. On the else path, that means that the entry is present. In some way or another, it's not null, which means it's not an empty um, entry. In which case, I pull while it's filling. In 99.999% of cases, it is not filling, and we just skip this. It just does a memory, it does one load, it compares it with filling, it doesn't match, and it falls through. In the case that another thread is accessing something that one thread is currently filling in, it's currently maybe in this insert routine or in any of this code before it stores it to the uh, table, this will spin until that entry has been filled in. So while this is filling, we just wait. At this point, we know it's been filled in. So we can then get access to the key value. We can then check if our key matches that value. If our key matches that value, then we know that we found an existing entry with that key and hash in the hash table, and we can return a reference, and we can say this reference already exists in the table. In which case, we didn't actually have to create the value. It was super cheap. We didn't have to end up making a new owned version of the key. So it's super cheap. That's the fast path in 99% of cases is you just fly into here and you return this out. Otherwise, if that entry is present and that was our hash table index and it didn't match our key, that means we had a collision. It means that the hash function that we used collided. However, the value that we actually end up having in there as the real key that we check uh, didn't match, in which case, we just fall through, we then wrapping add the hash, that'll come up here, we'll then mask it off to the size of the table, and then we'll go back and we'll repeat again and we'll try the next entry. So this handles collisions, this handles not overriding insertions, it handles atomic insertions, and it uh, handles atomic accesses. And the fast path in this case is you just fly through here and you don't actually have to create any new values. Um, since we're using these pointers that we boxed up, uh, we did box into raw, and we also have uninit memory for the keys, we have to implement drop ourselves, so we go through every entry in the hash table, we get the entry from the hash table, we make sure that that is not currently being filled in, it's impossible to have immutable access to the table while someone is still filling in the table, so it's impossible to have this state, but I still assert it just for sanity. If the entry is not null, that means that the entry is present. We convert that value back into a box to drop the value of the hash table. And then we also drop the key value that was allocated there because it could have potentially been allocated. In the case that you use a basic key like a U32, this just does nothing. This code doesn't even exist in the binary. But that's it. That is the logic between my atomic hash, uh, in my atomic hash table. And it's very quick. Uh, insert only, non-resizing, no locks, no growing, no reallocations, nothing. It's very, 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 very simple. Um, and I love it. It's great for things like coverage that are only ever increasing. You never decrease, you never uh, delete coverage. And if you want to have a way that you can change a value pointed to by a key, then you can do internal mutability by making that thing use only atomics or by having that thing uh, use a lock cell or a mutex. Um, so we have a way of dealing with that. Anyways, I also have an atomic vector. This is very similar. Um, what this does is you make a fixed size vector of n entries of t type. It pre-allocates that as zeroed out, well, pointers to those types. And then you're able to push elements, which are uh, boxed Ts. 
And this allows you to basically push things onto this vector um, where you can fill up this vector with a bunch of unique things uh, atomically. So you're able to atomically push onto this vector. You can get the length and capacity atomically, and you can also get the existing value. So this will look up the value, and then if that pointer is null, it's not been filled in yet, in which case return out none, otherwise return a reference to the contents. Same thing, we have our own drop handler here. But atomic vector allows us to have an atomically accessed uh, vector that can be inserted into, and it will just push all the way to the end. So I have a way to do that. Anyways, all that aside, those two data structures are going to be the fundamentals of how I do coverage. Um, uh, they're going to be the fundamentals of how I do coverage in this this uh, this kernel, this this fuzzer. So yeah, that's where we are. Anyone confused with that so far? Pretty straightforward. Um, they're just super. They're just super performance uh, non-locking uh, tables. All right. In that case, if there are no questions, then I think what we're going to do is we're going to set up a, a Windows target, and we're going to make a. Um, we're going to make. Uh, <laughs> I'm slowly convinced into being a Rust programmer. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. Like having having closures is really nice because my C version of that, which I have, in my first Rust version, because I, I like forgot I could use closures. Um, let's see, data structures, hash table. So here's that same code, but this is in C. But this one has to return, it returns a pointer to the thing, and then if the function returns one, then you have to fill in the thing because it's a pointer to a pointer, what you have to fill in. Otherwise, if it returns zero, it's actually the pointer to the entry itself, and you have to check all those things, and it's just a mess. The logic is identical, but having access to those closures means that we can skip that whole process, and we can just fill that entry in, lazily pop populate it when needed. If it's not needed, then it just is a fast uh, check for uh, existence in the table, which is really neat. I was going to learn Golang, but I might switch to Lust, uh, Rust, uh, being I already know Python. Yeah, I don't. I, I think Golang is fine, but I do think Rust is a little bit better. Um, sorry, I missed the vector code. Is it storing pointers or the whole type? It's it's uh, storing pointers. So whenever you push something to the atomic vector, it has a atomic pointer to boxes. So when you push something, you have to push that as a, a boxed T. So, but that's the logic there. All right. Gotcha. And the, and the reason behind that is um, I would need to have metadata. I'd have to have out-of-band metadata, like a bitmap of what things are valid if I wanted to actually have them contain Ts so I can know whether or not those Ts have been initialized. So instead, I just have pointers to the entries instead. Um, and that way, null means that it hasn't been initialized yet because it's possible that in use gets ahead of the backing. I could have eight threads come in and try to allocate something and in use goes to eight, but there are, all of these entries haven't been filled in yet. Uh, so it basically guarantees that I have a way of checking whether or not they've been initialized, which is basically if they're non-null or if they're null. Um, and that's that logic down here in get. I first get an index into this uh, table, and then if it's null, I know it's not filled in, I can return out. I don't even have to bound check it against in use because I don't care, because the entry is null if it's not in use. Um, so yeah, in theory, I could do a bitmap, and I could have a bitmap that gets filled in atomically, like bitwise ORed atomically, and then I can determine if I was the first one to uh, fill it in, and that will have the validity of those bits. Um, but it would increase the code complexity so much, and I really don't see a situation where I'm not storing more complex types in here, uh, where it really matters that I do that. So. Um, if that's an issue, I'll eventually change that, but my allocator will have no metadata in my kernel, so allocating a pointer to a U32 uh, is almost the same. <laughs> I guess I'll use uh, 
uh, a little bit more memory. It will use uh, 16 bytes for that allocation, the pointer to the allocation and the allocation itself, instead of just the four bytes for the U32. But if I'm storing U sizes, which is more likely, the overhead is only 2x, and it's just, it makes the code much simpler, and I'll, I'll pay that memory cost. Um, it also means I can get more locality to things. I can have a, a denser packed, um, like, getters, uh, getting those things, if the values were much more complex types, wider types, uh, it makes that faster. Obviously, I would just have the type be a box type for that. All right. So now we have to actually implement this code. Um, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to hop into Windows, and we're going to make an application that we can fuzz with coverage-guided feedback. It's just a super basic application. So we'll go and write something. I think we have a... In soup dumpling, we have a, oops, not soup dumpling. Um, in uh, chocolate milk uh, sausage factory, we have a test.c, which is kind of, that's the injector, uh, target.c. So this is going to be an example application that I think we're gonna snapshot here. So what I'm gonna do is, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually snapshot myself in test. Um, okay, so in this test code, I'm going to have this, if I do test on self, if I set that to true, which it is, it will inject and it will take a snapshot uh, when we hit this hook me, which is going to print hello world. So we're going to take a look at um, chocolate milk sausage factory, and we'll take a look at... Um, Let's see. So this hopefully will run it on one of my test machines and that will take a snapshot of itself. Okay, we have all of that set up. So let's go into this stream win 10. This is my test VM that we're doing this in. And I actually changed the snapshot encode a little bit. I made it a lot cleaner. It now stores the PID and TID because I'm actually using this to snapshot multi-threaded. Don't tell anyone, secret, secret. So, um, I can do this, it will self snapshot, and then we'll get the PID and the TID of the snapshot, and then an EBFE, so it spins forever. Um, but yeah, I have the PID and the TID of the snapshot, and this has the register state, and I also saved GS this time, which is sweet. How's the kernel coming along? The kernel is basically complete. We're actually just writing, uh, writing cool tools to do in the, or cool, cool things to do in the kernel at this stage. All right, so, what we want to do is we want to have something that is worth snapshotting. Just a, a smidge worth snapshotting. Nothing too crazy, um, but something just a little bit basic. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see. So for this, we're gonna we want to write a fuzzable application here. We want to write something that we can fuzz uh, that will benefit from code coverage. So I think what we'll probably end up doing is a bunch of comparisons. So we're gonna make this take a um, u int eight t buff and a size t len, a buffer and a length, and we'll pass those in and. What we'll do is we'll pass in um, uint 8t times buff is equal to malloc 128, and then we'll pass in buff and 128. So we'll pass it for fuzzing, we're going to pass in the full size thing. Um, and in here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if buff 0 is, uh, we'll just do hello. If that's an E, L, L, O, then we will crash in an extraordinary way. So hello, that's our that's our test, and we got to make sure that this doesn't get optimized to uh, a, a smaller comparison. And then here we'll just do uh, volatile char star uh, ox 
one, two, three, four, that, that, that's gonna be our, our crashing value, and we'll just write in a zero to that location. So, I think I did that first try. Oh, not quite, uh, 16 len unreferenced formal parameter. Oh yeah, we'll say like, if len is not equal to five, return there. So that way we're strict on the length. Um, and that should take that snapshot. I think we deleted these, but let's just redo it anyways. So this will build this, it'll self snapshot in um, basically right when we hit hook me. And it does that by patching over the bytes with this push racks, move racks, jump racks. Um, have you ever challenged yourself to reverse engineer the NT kernel? Well, I have the source to NT kernel, so no problem there. <laughs> No, I've, I've done NT kernel reversing before. Um, to me, it's, it's not, honestly, the NT kernel, ha since the NT kernel has um, uh, symbols, I actually think it's relatively easy to reverse out what it's doing. Even if you don't have source code or private symbols, the public symbols get you so far the way there. That's actually not too difficult of a target. And I encourage people to try it out and, and learn reversing the kernel. Um, okay, so we have a snapshot, and that's trampled over. It's trampled over something there, right? It, it, we, we write over ourself in this test on self mode, and we should have a snapshot in a way that we're gonna execute that. So I'm gonna actually check, um, I'm gonna check the shape of this hook me function. Um, okay, why don't I have hook me? Test hook me. There we go. So in this case, it does a, that's the comparison of that. And we'll just disassemble this function. And look, it's doing a one byte comparison at a time. Perfect. So this is exactly something that we could benefit with, uh, with code coverage. So uh, zero, one, two, three, four, hello. We pass in that buffer. We make sure if the length is not five, we return. If the length is five, then we do five separate comparisons and then we'll crash by writing to this bad address. Um, so we should be able to do that. Okay. Can you, show, can you show the NT window shell graphics drawing, like the GDI stuff? I mean, you can just whack that up in IDA yourself. Um, hello. Okay, so we got that. We have a snapshot. We do slightly care about the bytes that we overwrote. So we overwrote, I think 15 bytes is this hook. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 bytes. So we want to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So we clobbered kind of these first instructions. So we'll have to repair these instructions that we patched over on the snapshotting side of things. Uh, but that's easy peasy, lemon squeezy, no problem. Uh, we'll just dump to c colon slash snaps. And this is like test.dump. Okay. Isn't it reversing windows against the EULA? EULAs just don't really matter. <laughs> They just don't really matter. Um, okay, I think that hopefully worked. Like EULAs can stop the company from giving you the product, but they, they can't be used to legally pursue you, so who cares? <laughs> like, they can cut you off, they can deactivate your license. They can they can do whatever they want on that side of uh, of the world, but they can't they can't like you can't get in trouble for it. So who who fucking cares? Unless you consider losing your license as getting in trouble, but just get another license. <laughs> um. Okay. Sweet. Anyways, so we have that. We have that mini dump. Now, I don't know if that mini dump is sane. Uh, let's set SSH into this. 122.21. We'll go into snaps. 
and then we'll take a look at cdbz test.dump. So we'll see if we have all the thread context. We should. It doesn't really matter because I saved them well. Um, yeah, it looks like we don't have thread context for that first one because it's probably because it's spinning in that loop. Oh, that's another thread. We do have this context, and that's the one that we care about. Um, and we should be able to, at this point, we should be able to check out... Um, what do I replace, actually? I replace, in test mode, the location is hook me. So, hook me. Hook me should have that jump trampoline. I'm very confused. Um... For some reason, this is like displaying the old version, and I, I don't quite understand how. Let's hook me, and then that jumps over. Test main. All right, here's main. Let's take a look at what I load up as the address there. So we'll take a look at main. Flush instruction cache, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to but yeah maybe that's getting it confused here but yeah we'll uh we'll whack that in there and see obviously it's working but the debugger has a different view of that memory than what it is which is kind of weird so let's take a look at this um, you know, that's going to be a pain. Well, whatever. We, we know what the original is. We know that we got our snapshot, so that's all that matters to us. We can always go patch these in as needed. We have the RIP value that we need to, uh, to program. Um, so let's get this working. So let's fire this up, and we'll bang this over into, um, we'll scoop this. Um, this goes into server and then files. And then we'll scoop from um, 192.168.122.21 from snaps star into here. Um, oh, slash snaps. Okay, so we pulled everything down. So this is our special snapshot. And let's get this server running too. Oops. So we'll go into chocolate milk server, cargo run release. And then we're just going to change this. And I deleted that in a way that I would lose that. So here, paste. So this is our snapshot. So I'm saying, create me a new fuzz target using this snapshot. Um, and I should be able to build this. And... Um, no semicolon. Okay. So that's making a new fuzz target for this snapshot. And I think this should work. I mean, it's not going to do anything. Actually, it's going to it's gonna crash because PC is bad. And let's see. It's hitting that server, which is good. Um, oh, we're stuck in the EBFE. Yeah, I think that's where we are. I think we're stuck in the EBFE. So let me set a timeout. Um, oh, I'm not running fuzz cases. I'm not doing anything yet. Okay, so what we're going to do is we will create a worker. So do snapshot worker. Uh, let mute worker. So we're going to make a worker for this given core that we're running on, and then we're going to fork that from the snapshot, and then we will do worker.run fuzz case. We'll set the timeout to an, uh, set the timeout to 10 milliseconds. We have an injection routine, which is going to take a worker. So this is where we inject. And then we have a VM exit filter here, which will allow us to filter if we handle VM exits. In this case, uh, VM exit and worker here. We're just going to say we did not handle that VM exit. It's kind of the API I have running right now. 
And then that returns the final VM exit, and I think this should work. Uh, halt, we're technically not hitting, and worker, we're technically not using. So before every fuzz case, this first closure will get invoked, but this should, it, this should basically have page faults. I suspect that the RIP value will get, um, I suspect that all, um, hmm. Oh, I need to have a printing thing. I need to have something printing the stat. I haven't integrated that in yet to the generic. Let me, um, let me find that. Um, do, do, do. So I really need to, I need to make this code as part of this whole harness. And I'm gonna probably do that. I'm probably gonna polish up a lot of this code, but this is now gonna add a status print. And this is a snapshot, no underscore. Okay, so that's gonna, on one core, it's gonna print the statistics every second. And now we're gonna get to see what's happening when we're fussing. If you work for Microsoft, tell, Tell their EULA is stupid. I mean, what, what am what am I what am I gonna do? All right, so we're getting a page fault on virtual address zero. Um. So basically, this is faulting at virtual address zero because we don't set up RIP. So what we want to do is we want to figure out what RIP is supposed to be because that cannot be saved as part of the snapshot. Since we clobber RIP, we don't actually know what RIP is. So but I know that RIP is this. So I'm gonna say, before we fuzz, I'm gonna say worker dot vm dot uh, guest regs this dot RIP is equal to this. So that will now set RIP to execute that. Now I don't know if our version of that is going to be the original or not. Let's take a look. All right, so we're exiting on a syscall 25, and we t if we look uh, at the syscall table, um, do do do. Am I a 10x worker? Oh yeah, I'm the I'm the most 10x worker. Uh. OX, and I bet this is our right file. Uh, this is probably um, query information thread. Okay, and if we're hitting query information thread, that means that we are actually, wait, how are we hitting 2,663 coverage? <laughs> how are we hitting that much coverage? Set rip there. We're executing something. We got coverage. I think this is good enough for our, our testing. All we want to do is we want to report this up to a server so we can visualize it. So I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back. All right, so I have no idea what this is doing, but I don't care, right? I don't, I don't care that this isn't doing what I want yet because we want to get this coverage out. We want to visualize it. That's, that's the main goal here is getting all these uh, fuzzers synced. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually implement an API that does all this shit for you. So all of this where we create a snapshot, we make a worker, we spin all these things up. 
I, I want to really turn this into one nice, clean, universal thing. Phoenix, this is not, this is not the Microsoft uh, uh, leak stream where I just tell you and give you source and show you all these things. <laughs> it's not how this works, man. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what you're expecting. Like, I, I don't think that's how that works. If you've ever been employed, I think you'll understand that that is not how that works. Um, okay. So I want to wrap all of this stuff up into one nice little container. I want the status reporting done for you. I want the creation of the VM done for you. Um, I want to make this like one seamless thing where you basically create like a snapshot. And then somehow you have to communicate that with others, but that's relatively difficult. Um, give us give us all symbols for Hyper-V or else we'll report you to Twitch. Damn it. Damn it. You got me. The Twitch police. <laughs> uh, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at... I don't know how I make this easier. I think I think it's time that I make like a a set once. Something where I can initialize something once and then others can get a reference to that thing. That's kind of currently what I do. I do that in a lot of places in this kernel and I think it's I think we're due. I think we're due for something that fills something in where this would be like a, a set once or something like that, or I think there's a na there's actually a Rust crate that does that. I'm still in middle school, by the way. I'm Twelve BTW. <laughs> please, please give Windows sandbox. I want to eat sand. I'll tell you to pound sand, cryptos. You can pound some sand. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, so now is when I have to work on architecture. And architecture is a, a hard problem, but I want to make this really seamless. I want it to just kind of all magically work for you. And to make things magically work for you, I need to expose APIs. And expose APIs, I need to think about what users might potentially do with this tool. Uh, so currently, the API. It's a little messy because you have to handle your own printing. You have to handle your own worker registration. So I think I'm going to change that a little bit. So I think we're going to leave this for now. This sucks. I hate it. I hate it. It makes me feel bad. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to make a... We're just going to make our worker do this. So this is going to be the new way of doing the code. And what we'll do is snapshot run fuzz case. And I think that'll create a worker for you, question mark. And then invoke that on it. And um, honestly, I think I want to just, I think I'm just going to call this fuzz. And then the timeout, I'll probably set up outside. Yeah, there's so many different ways that we can we can do this. The question is, what is the best way to do this? Um. Huh. What I might have you do is you might implement a structure, and then you implement like fuzz on that thing, and then you have some callbacks that get invoked. Let's see how that would look. We'd have a trait. This is like a fuzzer. We would have an inject callback that'll get invoked every fuzz case with your input and then a reference to the worker that's mutable. And then that worker gives you access to the um, snapshot itself. We're then going to write the... Um, so inject is going to be run every fuzz case. We'll have like a prepare. Um, just tried Russ. His function input variables are so stupid. I mean, like name colon type is not like C at all. I mean, it's not C. 
<laughs> I don't like my BMW because it's not like a Honda. I what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Buy a Honda then. <laughs> Problem solved. All right, we're going to prepare. This is going to take... Se uh, you know what? This is going to give you mute self. You're going to be real mutable up in here. So that'll give you access to, like, your own context. Um, and then we'll have a prepare. This will return a... Um, hmm. Hmm. Appreciate the name type convention is better for the parser. Absolutely. I hated it initially, but I, I've grown to actually like it a lot more. I think it's a lot more clear. Um, mute self. I want this to return maybe a worker. But it's advertises the same as C. I don't know where it's advertises the same as C. I think you're not. I think you're misinterpreting that. Prepare. Ah. I might have to register another routine. Maybe I'll do like boxed functions instead of a trait. If I do box functions, then I can't give you a context structure. You can make your own context structure. Um, that's a that's a that's an answer. Um, um God damn. Making APIs is tough. I really like how I do it in my vectorized emulation stuff. So I think I'll take a look at that. I think that I use a builder pattern to create a snapshot and then I share that snapshot with others and I register things on it. So I make the mutable snapshot. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, I forget how I... So I need one thing that gets called that will create your initial snapshot. And I think that will return a uh, fuzz target, maybe? A fuzz target. Shared state for an application being fuzzed. Yeah. If I have prepare, this returns a... Hmm. I don't know if I want to do traits or if I want to do uh, closures that call uh, functions. Okay, so what I could do is... We get that. <sighs> Dude, why is designing APIs so hard? This is like the hardest part of pretty much anything that I do is, is trying to figure out the user story and how it's going to be uh how it's going to be designed so i'm going to create a thing and i think i'm going to say like maybe like fuzz job new so i can do fuzz job and then i can say like I like this. I like where this is going. This is very similar to my vectorized emulator. So this is going to be like create VM. And this is a callback for VM creation. And we'll do like create VM. Oh, I got a cat. I got a wild cat walking around. Meow. Um... 
I usually write the code first to know the user would want it, then make the f uh, formal API. I, I know what I want, so I'm not reaching too much here. I know what I want, but I'm trying to figure out if I want to use traits or if I want to use... Um, yeah, so I think this is what I'm going to do. Cat, meow! Yeah, it's just walking around. I've seen a lot of animals today. I saw some deer today. I saw some cats today. I saw a lot of bunnies today. The animals are happy that it's warm out. All right, we're going to make a struct fuzz job. I'm going to actually call this a fuzz session. What do I call it? Are you outside? No, I'm close, though. I'm close to outside. We're going to take a look at, uh, not sushi roll, soft serve. Um, folk aisle. Aisle session. Yeah, I call this an aisle session. So we're going to call this a fuzz session. And this is going to be a session for multiple workers to fuzz a shared uh, job. Wild duck appears. In before we see wild furries on the street. Hey, I'm not, I'm not wrong with being a furry. Okay, we're going to impl uh, fuzz session. And you're going to say new, new, pub fn new. This is going to return a self, a slef, a slef. This is uh, create a new empty fuzz session. And what we're going to do for a fuzz session, this is going to be pub. Hey, Chad, if you were a furry, would you, would you have the pan on, t on type tail or plug in type? Oh, the pin on type tail or the plugin type. Oh, I see what I see what you're going for there. You gotta go with the plugin type. <laughs> Don't pin that shit on. Come on, plug it in. You gotta live you gotta live life to the fullest. Enjoy all all of your senses. Um, we're gonna make a new fuzz session. And for this, we'll have a create VM uh, callback. And this is, um, returns a, a self, a slef, as we've called it before. This is um, register a new callback to be used when a VM should be created. This is used to establish the first um, state of the snapshot that will be reverted to in subsequent, subsequent fuzz cases. Thus, this is used to create your master slash initial VM state. Okay, so this we're just going to take self dot create vm callback and assign that to callback, and then this will be a callback create vm callback, and a create vm callback is going to this is going to be a function which takes in nothing and produces a one of these a fuzz target. And yeah, hey jump on, how's it going? Looking at LVM's fuzz data provider for Rust has some in interesting properties. Yeah, I've never looked at it before. Never looked at it before. So this is a callback invoked by a fuzz session once to create the initial VM state. And that's going to be a fuzz target. And in here, we're going to have a... Honestly, I think that's going to be implied. Callback. Create VM callback. Um, and we'll say the uh, callback. Yeah, and that doesn't need to be typed. 
we can just say takes in a, a closure, and that closure produces, it's called once, and it produces a fuzz target. What did Microsoft write? A universal Windows platform in its weird C++ abomination? You mean C Sharp? Or are you talking like .NET based uh, C++? The new WinRT Rust thing? I just saw that today. I haven't looked at it. I have no idea what it does. But I'm just going to assume it's cool because it uses Rust. <laughs> Alright, so this is going to be the... Um, I don't know if fuzz target is a good good thing. C plus plus one RT. I I have I'm not familiar with it at all. I'm sure it's probably really good for development speed, but probably and it's probably pretty good for like rapid prototyping. Cause that's what people want. Alright, are we gonna make a fuzz target here? Um I think so. Fuzz target has the snapshot info, a start RDTSC value when we created it, raw memory contents. I think I can move these into, which back the original snapshots. Yeah, do I want this to take Do I want to have that return a fuzz target? If I have that return a fuzz target, it does like kind of work right away. That creates a new self. I'd have to lifetime that because I got the net mapping. Hmm. Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, all this code's going to break. I uh, We're about to like break everything temporarily. So we're going to have a... Uh, we're going to take the server, which is going to be uh, an I. Or a... Yeah, an I. And an I is going to be an into... Maybe an asraf. Yeah, we'll do an into an IPv4 adder. So we're going to say if that thing can be converted into an IPv4 address, and we'll pull that in from create net IPv4 adder. I hate, I hate breaking everything. I really do. But we have to. We're going to have to comment out all this shit while we break it. Well, that's acceptable. I'll make a new fuzz session. Uh, expects a self. Okay. Uh, create VM callback. Okay. So this is um, register a new callback to get called once after the initial VM uh, mm, gets called once to establish the initial VM state. This is what creates the basis for all subsequent fuzz cases when they are reset. So this is going to be like the um, initialize the VM. I don't know. Create VM callback. I'm not sure yet. Okay, type create VM callback. This is going to take a mutable reference. This is going to take a mutable reference to a fuzz session. And this is session. So we have a fuzz session here. And yeah, this is just going to be a call. Oops. 
create VM callback is this function, this. Um, a callback used to initialize the fuzz session to a predefined state. Uh, to an initial state, I don't know. So we'll make that create VM callback, and this should like work, maybe? Uh, I got a halt here. And then we're gonna just hack some shit in on if core ID is zero, just on core zero for now, so we don't have to worry about threads yet. But we're gonna make a real nice API. And then everything's gonna sync, and it's just magically behind the scenes, everything's just gonna fucking work, and it's gonna be fantastic. Okay, set self. Um, yeah, so we'll have a create VM callback, and this is the... Um, is that just gonna get called right away? It is, so we don't need to save this callback. This is, um, uh, invoke a closure with access to the initial memory and register states of the, invoke a closure with access to the initial memory and register states of the snapshots such that they can be mutated um, to create the basis for all fuzz cases. So this is going to be like init, and it's going to be optional, init master VM. Um, and this will take a closure, which is a function once, which takes a session, takes a mutable fuzz session reference. And we'll just yoink this whole thing out and use a where clause. Where, paste. Okay, then what we're gonna do is we will do callback, mute self, and then return self. Okay. Oh yeah, that's an F now. F's in chat for the closure. Um, 48. Yeah, we fucked that one up, didn't we? Where F. Okay, we're really fucking this one up. I don't think we name the parameters. Okay, can't borrow as mutable. Mute. And that should be good. Fn once, we invoke that. Okay, so here's roughly how this API is gonna look. We're going to do fuzz session. Um, and let's see, do I pull in any of these things? I do by, by. Am I using fizz adder? Okay, I'm using fizz adder. I don't think I'm using lock cell. Okay, 86. So in here, this is gonna be like our test fuzzer. Um, uh, we'll do this in a module just so we can like make sure we have like a good isolated thing. So this is gonna be like test fuzzer fuzz. And then we can make a new module pub mod test fuzzer. And we'll split kernel source test fuzzer. So this is basically the code that you would write if you're writing a fuzzer. So we'll pub fn fuzz. Okay, so now we're going to temporarily limit this to only core zero. So we're gonna say if it's not equal to zero, CPU halt. Just for now, we'll just hack that in there. Uh, we'll halt forever now. Then what I can do is we will um, let me fuzz target is equal to fuzz target new, and then we're gonna pass in the IP port of the server and also the file name of this snapshots. 
Um, we'll just yoink this. Um, paste, paste. All right, does that fit? Oh, it barely does. Okay, so this is create a new fuzz target for a provided uh, folk dump. So right now we only support folk dump, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, yep, and we got some, let's increase our comments here, and then we'll say here we'll run test fuzzer fuzz. I don't know how I deleted that code, but I did. Okay, unknown fuzz target, use crate snapshotted app fuzz target, and we're going to separate all these things into different modules and crates as we go along. So here we're going to create a new fuzz target with those specific parameters. So what I want to do is when I make a fuzz target, I, I call it fuzz target, wait a minute, the fuzz session, and we'll call it session. Uh, create a new fuzz session. Okay. Fuzz session. Very similar to a fuzz target. We're going to core out a lot of the stuff there. So we're going to have the um, snapshot name. That's uh, just a, a str. Technically, this is an S. And we'll say... Um... I will say where I into IPv4 adder and S is uh, as ref stir. Okay, nice. So now that's a little bit more extensible. That's going to then create that snapshot. Now we want to actually download that. So we're gonna core out a lot of stuff from snapshot at app. So I'm gonna vertically split this or horizontally split this so I can get the old thing. So fuzz target has a net mapping and I map in So this is basically what I do here. You're just going to yoink that and we're going to paste it into here and this is um, network map the memory file so we'll convert that name um, snapshot name, let's say name. Okay, so map that as read-only, map the info file as read-only, create a new register state, get access to the snapshot info, um, consume a, consume a type from the snapshot info and update the point. Actually, you know what? I'm probably going to put this in a, what the fuck is it? A worker? I think worker is where I implement read and write. It is. So, I think worker, that references a snapshot. Um, I think that'll be master and be optional. And then we're gonna fork from the master. We're gonna reset to the master. We'll pull through to the master. I think that's how we're gonna, we're gonna do that. So we're gonna have like, uh, Okay. Here's what we gotta do, unfortunately. So we're gonna... God, we gotta break a lot of this shit. VM RNG, UDP bind, UDP address stats. We don't need any of those. Well... If we have stats here, we can merge into the master. If we put in a lock cell. I might just have it just be a VM. Because the VM contains all the memory. That has a ref to the fuzz target. I want to create the master VM. I think that's what I want. Then he can get access to guest regs through that and all the memory. Um. The fact that I lazily page things in here me means I have to have access to that server. 
So I can't do it on VM. So I do need something. I do need like a worker here that can have a master. Yikes. Hmm. I'm going to have a master VM, right? That'll allow me to run the VM. And then I'll have a the master VM will need access to read and write. It'll need access to the net mapping for the memory, which I can put in an arc. All right. So fuzz session, here's my, here's my theory. We're going to comment out, is that snapshot info? Okay. We do want that. Stats, fuzz target, basically all the shit comments, comments it out. So this should still build, if we're not using it. 47, can't use that. Okay. Uh. Let name stir is equal to name as ref. This is uh, convert the generic name into a reference to a string. Seen in a ride stream? Yeah, have a good night. Hell yeah, get some good sleep, man. Okay, server. Expected stir found I. Is that not an IPv4 address? It's totally not. Yeah, it's not an IPv4 address. Okay. That's fine. We'll just remove that generic. Okay, where S? So this should be able to net map those things. This will theoretically work. It doesn't really print anything right now, but that should have net mapped and parsed all of those things, which is good. Now the question is, how do I want to store this information? Um, so let's have like network mem. I think, and that'll be mutable. Hmm. Hmm. I think that will be mutable. So this will be a net mapping. This is the network mapped uh, memory for the VM. And we'll just say network mem is memory. Let's take a look. What we get here, expected lifetime parameter, yeah. Impl a fuzz session a, should work, should build, should be valid. Okay, so that made network map memory for the VM. Right. And we're gonna map that as Mutable. But by the time we start creating VMs from it, it will no longer be mutable, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is fine. This is fine. Then we have the info. And the info is read only. We only parse things out of there. We actually make... We make a snapshot info structure. And how do I turn that into a VM? Oh yeah, that, um, yeah, I think we can consume some of these. We'll just grab the memory region information there. And then this is the master register states. Oh, we'll make a VM. Master VM is a VM uh, 
master VM all the workers uh, reset to on each fuzz case. All right. Now, vert to offset is vert to offset. Okay. So now we have a vert to offset. That's going to allow us to get access to that. And now we need master VM, which is a VM, which we should have access to that. So we'll make VM, VM. I forgot how we make VMs. So I think we just call VM new. VM. Make a new user mode VM. Okay. So I'll make a new user. And what we want to do for when we make a new user, let me VM is equal to VM new user. And we'll do VM.guest regs is equal to the registers, the regs. Uh, create a new user VM and uh, initialize registers to the snapshot state. Okay, and then at this point, we can say VM. And that assignment should work. Oh, this is master VM. Um, 27. Yeah, that's gone. We no longer have a snapshot info. So when we get a fuzz session, we have a VM. We have a network, network memory that's used to back that VM. And this should work. Okay. And now what I want to do is I think I want to actually wrap that VM in a um maybe I'll have to make a callback that gets invoked when I have to page something in. That's actually relatively tough. Um Yeah, I think instead of having master VM be a VM, this is going to be similar to this fuzz target where I'll have a reference to the net mapping. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Uh, so we're going to make this arc. So when we create that, it no longer is mutable. Arc new. I think... I think, oh, how do I want to do this? Um, yeah, that's going to be an arc new memory. And then that doesn't need to be mutable, which is good. I don't want that to be mutable as read only. Okay, so we can't modify that memory. I think that fits on one line now. Yep. So the memory is not modifiable. Good. And then we'll wrap that up in an arc. And that's kind of the basis for things. And... Um, then I think what we'll have is... We'll have like a... Pubstruct worker... Similar to what we had before, and this is going to have a master, which is a optional reference to a worker. This is a master worker that we are forked from. This will allow us to do arbitrary nesting of VMs, or arbitrary forking of VMs, which I think will be nifty. So to do this, I'm going to do this. Yoink. All that stuff. And we'll impl this on worker. Impl a worker a. And we all have a way of reading, writing. Okay. All right. So then the worker has a master. And then this will actually have the register state and stuff. I think we're getting there. It's it's really tough to figure out how to architect all this stuff because we're we're actually we're basically implementing a VM level fork. So what this is gonna have is network memory and then we'll have an option on this.
Okay, uh, 253. Pause the session. And then it's important that this... We're actually just going to arc that. That guarantees we don't have to worry about either of those being mutable. It guarantees that we don't have mutable access to those. And nor does anyone else, which is great. That's exactly what I want. So fuzz session no longer has a ref A, but it will because we're going to add... This is going to be the master VM, and this is now going to be a worker A. This is going to be the master VM states. Okay, and now I'm going to create a master VM, so I'm going to have some way of making this worker. So I'll do like pub fn new um, from net, something like that. Oh, and this is the VM. So this is the uh, raw virtual machine that uh, this worker uses. So that has the register states and uh, memory stuff. The master will refer to a master, network mem, the network stuff. So we're going to say new from net, and then we're going to have memory, which will be an arc net mapping A. And I don't think I have these lifetimes 100% correct, but it's acceptable. We'll uh, relax them. Right now, they're like overly strict. But we'll return a worker that has a master none. Network mem memory, a uh, sum memory, and then we'll have a VM, which is a VM new user. So this is uh, create a new empty VM from a network backed from network backed memory. Okay, nice. Now, we have some issues here. Snapshot. So we have to change how these translates and reads and writes work. Actually, just translate technically. So we're just going to comment all this stuff out and then work on the fuzz session, which is going to create the master worker. And the master VM is going to be a worker. And here we'll do a worker new from, from net memory and then we'll this will be arc new so we're gonna pass in that memory there vert to offset we do still want that I think we right back I'm gonna hit the head we're, we're making good progress All right, so we're going to, we need that vert to offset in the new from net. Um, so that's going to have to have the, this vert to offset. Yeah. So the vert to offset will go in here as well. So of an arc containing a tuple, which will be, That okay. So you have a worker and then new from net three sixty four. This will take a uh, vert to offset and the memory. So I'll make a new worker. Uh, let's 
master is equal to just reformatting this code a bit. So I'm going to get the master there. So this is uh, creates a new master VM from the uh, information provided. And then we'll do master.vm.guestregs is equal to regs. So create a new master VM from the information provided. Make a new one from a uh, network backed memory. And then. Um, do I even want that concept? I do. 359. Expected a net mapping from the tuple. Yep. It's because this now is going to take a tuple. A little gross. I maybe should strongly type that. Oops. Polishing this stuff is not difficult, uh, at least for something like this. So I'm fine with just hacking this in place and then seeing what we get. Seeing if this works. Um, mainly, I'm trying to prove that I can actually represent what I want to represent here. 37, network mem. Oh, I yoinked that, didn't I? I totally didn't want to do that. Paste, done. Okay. So now I have network memory. 360 can't assign because it's not mute. So I'll make that mute. Create a new master with the vert to offset table and the regs. Okay. And we'll just do like um, struct net uh, backing. And this will have the vert to adder which is this, so we're, we're just typing this right away because it's just gonna look better. Um, mapping of virtual uh, valid pages to their offsets in the memory uh, buffer. And then we have this net mapping. So this is memory, and this is the raw memory backing the snapshot. So this is the um, I don't know uh, a memory backing uh, uh, memory network backed VM memory information. I'm fine with that for now. Would you re recommend Rust or C++ for getting into low level dev? I recommend C not C++ for getting into low-level dev, and then I would transition into Rust. I don't think C++ is a good language for really anything, other than, other than if you need to actually know C for whatever your target is. But I think it's uh, generally not a very good language. Okay. Not recommend memory for the VM. Perfect. And then this will now take an arc net backing a and return a self beautiful and just put a little curly brace all right uh, 369 that now needs to take a net backing and we'll just construct that we have the vert to offset as well as the memory we use the same name so we can just do this cleanly all right so this will create a master VM from that information. And it needs to be an arc. So arc new. So we basically pass all those things in. We, rack them, we wrap them in an arc. Uh, vert to offset. Doesn't have that field. Vert to offset. And what's going on here? Private type and a public interface. Yep, that's fair. Let's say pub. Oh, new from net doesn't need to be pub. This is internal. No one else is going to use that. Okay, now we're good. Hey, do you have siblings? I have one older brother. What languages are OS is made with? Uh, assembly, C, C++, Rust. Kind of a whole mix. Um, okay, so let's check out. 
So we made that session. It doesn't need to be mutable because we're not doing anything with it, but that's fine. That's just us. That's on us. So now what I want to do is I need to enable all this translating code, which will allow me to actually get access to the VM's memory. Um, and since we're lazily uh, creating these VMs, we actually need to be able to pull in the memory from over the network. So to do this, um, master worker we are forked from. If there is no master, um, uh, if there is no master, translations or memory is entirely. Uh, if there's no master memory, God, I don't know a good way to describe what I'm gonna say. Basically, if you have master set, we're going to pull in pages from master if you don't already have them in your VM. And if network mem is set, then we're going to use that. So it kind of depends on which backing I want to actually use. So currently I use, um, really all that I care about is translate. So the translate routine, um, right, fn translate, and then we want the first one, which is this. So this is going to translate a virtual address of the guest into a physical address on the host. Um, so what I want to do is if that is not present in the guest, but it is in the vert to offset table, then I want to actually grab it from the master. Or I want to grab it from the vert to offset. But if it's in the master, I want to grab it from the master. So let's see. What we're going to do is... Um, um, okay, so this needs to change. This is the, this is the only hard part of what we're doing. Once this is done, it's just, it's just writing code. But for now we gotta, we gotta actually like think. So basically... In some situations, we'll be able to back it from memory. Okay, if the page wasn't mapped, that's the only situation we care about. Um, we have copy on right here. Um, return the original page. Otherwise, I want to... Um, shit. This is tough. This is tough. Sorry, I just got here. What are you doing exactly? We're writing a hypervisor that's designed for uh, fuzzing, for finding bugs in applications. Um, and right now we're just kind of working on our API and how we want to actually use this hypervisor. Um, hey, I'm relatively new to your channel. I'm uh, an almost 24-year-old software developer. And um, let me just say, your knowledge is super impressive to be 26 years old. Uh, do you have formal training in software development, like a BS, MS, and comp site, or something similar? I do not. Um, I just went directly into working after high school. So that is my, that is my latest education, is, is just high school. <laughs> Did the trick. It's good enough. Um, fuck. So, like, I know how I can do this. It's easy to do this. The question is, how do I do this cleanly and with the smallest amount of code duplication? So, I think what I'll do is if I get access to the memory, and that is from snapshot. Now, in this case, I don't have a snapshot necessarily. So I think what I have to do is I have to get rid of these. I have to get rid of those generically. Now I just go and fix up these warnings and errors. Um, I'm in the same situation as you. I'm 18, and I have to choose between going to university and going to work. I have a job offer, but the salary isn't that good. If you're going to learn things from the job, then the salary is better than any college, even if it's basically minimum wage. You will learn a lot more at work than you will ever learn in university. 
by an absolute landslide. I'll say that you'll probably learn more in your first year of work than you'll learn in your four years of education. Full stack dev, boring JS and Python, but I love C and C++ reverse engineering. If it's not in a field you don't want to do, then I would recommend not doing it. Unless you're just trying to get your foot in the door, but getting your foot in the door, doing a full stack development job is not going to get you your foot in the door really for C and C++ dev. So I would try and find a C and C++ job. But you got to already know C and C++ to a passable level. Better than like most university students, which is uh, basically you have to have like 15 hours worth of C and C++ experience. Uh, are you currently, are you running Linux as the main OS on this workstation? I am. You need to see in C++ is garbage? Yeah, it's really. You just, you just don't really learn anything in, in university for C and C++. I'm sure, like, of course some schools have it. But at most schools, you, you learn absolutely fucking nothing um, for C and C++. You learn, like, data structures in fucking Scala or some, you know, whatever your teacher's language is that they learned 40 years ago and they haven't, like, learned a new language since. And you learn how to write data structures in your professor's favorite language. Um, and that's <laughs> really about it. You'll learn, like, what if statements are and what loops are. Then you'll learn what data structures are in, like, your advanced course. Maybe if you have, like, a hardware course, they'll go into, like, a little bit into, like, MIPS assembly. Uh, but that's basically all you're going to get out of most schools. Of course, some schools have exceptional programs, exceptional professors. But when when jobs hire, they're not hiring based on where you went to school. They're just hiring based on what you know. So it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. I agree with that. Working full-time as a developer teaches you so much more than university. University just gives you a foundation, but... Uh, with so much information freely available on the internet, you can teach yourself the foundation. Absolutely. Um, I'm auditing this code based to find a thick bug, as my dream bug right now is a junior security researcher. Want to become Pona own master? It's really not too difficult to get into security right now. Um, the barriers to entry for junior security jobs are basically like, literally, can you read C? You don't have to be able to write it. You don't have to be able to find bugs. You don't have to be able to write fuzzers. You don't have to be able to run fuzzers. You don't have to be able to run Linux and Windows. You just have to like know how to find bugs in one target for one architecture for one OS environment. That's pretty much passable for a junior security researcher at pretty much any group <laughs> right now. Like That basically will, will do the job. Like, security research, uh, the barrier to entry, like, basically, until you're a senior security researcher, it's not really expected that you do anything. Like, I would say most people are probably not expected to find bugs until they're, like, almost about to be senior, or senior already. <laughs> is that enough to get into MSRC? Probably not. Microsoft is a top, uh, top company, and it's a lot harder to get into than uh, obviously a lot of others. Like, you're not gonna get into PC unless you're slaying it. Um, God damn it, how do we do this? Basically, if there's a master present, then we want to page in from the master. If there's not a master present and there's network present, then we want to page in from the network. If neither of them are present, we have a fault. Allocate fizz, copy in the initial bytes from the network map memory. I don't want to... That does avert to offset right away. The thing is, I don't want to actually perform the translation if I don't need the result. What is what is PZ Project Zero? Project Zero is probably the best security research firm 
in the public domain right now. Um... Shit. I want to do this, like, lazily. I'm going to do the translation once, I think. If that offset is not present, then it's not there. What's the best private security research team? It's a really hard question. There are, there are a bunch that are all exceptional. It's really hard to know unless you're involved in all of them. Okay, so all of these need memory. If it's not mapped, we need memory. The only case, the only case, so we're gonna get that translation. We're gonna attempt to translate the page right fucking away. We're gonna restructure this code and we're gonna make it real nice. If Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say if let mapping is sum page is mapped, it is possible blah 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 and then we're going to say if um this is going to get the permission um Let's see, let's page writable is equal to this. So we're gonna say the page is writable is equal to that, and this is not equal to zero. And we're gonna say if the page, if the page is, if it's a write and the page is writable or if it's a write and the page is writable, or if it's not a write and it's mapped, then we can return out some page. So this is uh, first determine if we need to perform a copy on write or create uh, or make a mapping for an unmapped page. So we're gonna say get the translation. Then we're going to determine if that translation is writable. If that page is writable, and this is a write, then it's fine. Or if it's not right. So we're going to say if the page is writable, and this is a write, or if the operation is not a write, then the existing allocation can satisfy the um, translation request. Okay, now that means at this stage, we either must perform a copy on write or we must perform a copy on write or uh, map a, an unmapped page. So in both cases, uh, get the original contents of the page. So let's say a ridge page is equal to if let sum um if let sum self dot master oops master is equal to self dot master we should be able to ref that this is uh get the page from the master else if let sum network and yeah, we'll say net backing is equal to self.networkmem. Else, um, page is not present and cannot be filled from the master or network memory. Return none. Okay. Logic checks out. Boom. Okay, so we have return issues, but I think that's it. So now what we have to do is, in the case of the master, what we're gonna do is we'll get, we'll translate it. And we'll translate the whole page. 
So we'll do, um, let's align vatter is equal. Oh, and that's some page. We got to add that offset. Do, do, do. We almost fucked that up, guys. Almost fucked that up. This needs to be return sum fizz adder this. So we're going to get the page, so the physical address of the page, and then the offset of the virtual address into that page. Okay, next, we're going to get the um, align the virtual address. So we'll do, this is a vert adder, and we'll do vatter.0 and not oxffff. So that will virtual align it down. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to translate that. So now we can do master translate. Um, this. And it's not for writing in this case. Vatter, not for writing. And then if that fails, then we can't get it. Otherwise, we will attempt to get it from the network backing. In the case of the network backing, the physical address of the network backing. Um, shit, what will that be? What language would you... Recommend ones learning uh, low level ones? C. Um. Do, do, do. Getting used to pointers and how memory is handled in C is pretty paramount to value, uh, learning low level stuff. Absolutely. Okay. Get the page from the master. Then. We will get the page. Page is not mapped. This is touch that. Get this page. Okay. We're getting there. Oh, I'm so scared we're going to fuck this up. Uh, touch the mapping to make sure it's downloaded and mapped. We'll do offset is equal to net backing dot vert to offset dot get for the virtual address which is the align vatter um so we'll get that so this is uh get the offset into the network backing which holds the uh, page get the offset into the network packing which holds the page containing the I'll send in the network backing, which holds the page containing the, um, uh, holds the page can, yeah, which holds the page for the provided virtual address. We're then going to touch the mapping to make sure it is downloaded and mapped, and this is net backing dot memory. And then we get access to the page table. And then here we do net backing dots. Okay, so we're going to use the page table to translate. Um, there we do a map. Okay, okay. We'll do that. We have a virtual address. We're going to translate that for, for not writing, just for reading. We'll flatten that, and then memory page has to be accessible in this stage. And then we get the page out of there, in which case we can just return that. And this is actually directly the return result. So this is uh, look up the physical page backing for the mapping. OK, so at this stage, if the page is writable and we're requesting a write, or we're not writing, then we just return this out. Otherwise, change the, the original contents of the page in the master to get the physical address. Oh, and this is the align vatter. So from the aligned virtual address, we translate that for reading to get the physical address in the master. Um, in this case, we take the aligned virtual address, we get the vert to offset. We got an offset, we touch that memory. We then get access to the page table. We then translate that memory in the current page table. 
and then we get access to the page and we return out the page. Otherwise, there was no page present. Put a semicolon there. Okay, 206. Offset. How is offset not a U size? Oh, deref it. There we go. Okay, now we're just not returning the right thing, which is fine, no problem. Um, all right, so now we actually have to perform the cow stuff. So in this case, um, I don't even care about the original page. Uh, this is um, promotes the original page via cow. And that's just if let sum. Oh, yeah, if there is a page and a PTE. Honestly, just if there's a page. We don't care about the PTE anymore. We do care about the PTE because that's where we're going to write. Okay. So here we're going to say, if let some mapping promote the original page to cow. In which case, we're going to allocate a new page, promote it via cow, and we'll write that back in. And we'll tab this in. So allocate some new physical memory. We get mutable access to that physical memory. We then copy in the memory from the original page. Uh, let RO page is equal to unsafe mm slice fizz mute page 4096. So this is get a slice, oops. Get a slice to the original read only page. Starbury Hacker, thank you so much for the 100 biddies. Hope you're enjoying your time here. Okay. Um, get a slice to the original read only page, which is what we got from here the ridge page. Then we're going to allocate a new page. We're going to get access to the new page, and then we're going to copy from this slice from the RO page. And then we're going to map that in as user write and present, which is true. Promote the page view, cow. And then we can return the physical address of this page. Uh, we'll grab the page here. We'll do this. Let page is equal to this. Otherwise, uh, page was not mapped. Is this portion of the code for migrating VM instances between machines across the network? No, this is just for... Um, this is for uh, paging in VM pages which are not present. Uh, and we do this in a pretty complex way. Um, we can run VMs without any memory because we page in things as needed from over the network. So we already have network-based uh, VM images. So what we're doing is we're restructuring the code base um, to handle the concept of master such that we can fork uh, from, an, from an existing, um, uh, from an existing, uh, like, set up. So we can fork off of a bunch of masters and then we can pull things in. It's going to be a really interesting model, but we can effectively fork an arbitrary VM with very little overhead. Um, okay. So I know that didn't explain it too well. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do for this. 158. Align virtual address. Oh, that's here. 158. Um, 
correct. All right, so we're going to get the aligned virtual address. That's free. Then we're going to translate. OK, then we got page 177 here. Page. This is the original page. Yeah, that'll actually be the physical address of the page. And then we'll add that. It's gross, but it works. OK, PTE 236. So down here, uh, this is PTE. Okay, promote the original page via cow. If an else, and then else the page was not mapped. And then we have all this code. Page is not mapped. Okay, I think that's all the meat of this function. Oh my god, I thought that built for a second. Offset. Yeah, we don't have an offset anymore. Yeah, so anywhere that does this, this is no longer, this is now um, RO page. So this is page need to be cowed from the network map file. Map it in as RW, return the physical address of the newly created page. So that should be pretty much done. Now we have 259. These are aligned virtual address, aligned virtual address. Then all of these, um, we've already touched that memory. This, we already have that page. And thus, that page is the orig page. Yeah. So then down here, we can write in the orig page, not zero. Page is only being accessed for reads. Read alias the guest virtual memory directly into the network map page as read only. And then this is the original page. OK, 186 master can't be marred, borrowed as mutable. Uh, OK. Master translate. Fuck. That requires mute. Ah, oh, shit. Oh, no, what have we done? What have I done? I can't have an immutable version of this. Wait, why is this mute? It's because page table translate needs to be mute. Let's take a look. Uh, shared page table source translate. No, that doesn't need mute. So does this whole thing need mute then? Map raw. Technically, that needs mute now. That, now that I added dirty. Oh. Okay. Um. Shit.
I'm gonna have to make another one of these functions, aren't I? This will be like translate mute. Nah, uh, it's just gonna be translate, and this is gonna be like. That'll actually copy and write all those things. And this is just like, get page. Okay, we'll do that. Get page. It's just this. Oh, but the master might need to pull it into their memory. Oh. Shit, and this should this should be mute. This translate. I'm gonna make that mute. Hopefully that doesn't break anything. I don't think I have any code relying on that, luckily, but that's now more correct. Uh, 186. Uh, master's just gonna go in a fucking lock cell. We're gonna rarely access that. Doesn't it doesn't matter too much. And I should have access to all those. Are you a sec senior security researcher? I am. I am indeed. Master.lock.translate. Yes! All right, it builds. We did it. Uh, Okay. What are your thoughts on Christopher Domus? I've never worked with him before. So I'm not sure. I think his work's pretty neat. But it, it's really hard to judge people unless you've worked with them before. It's pretty easy to, uh, like... It's pretty easy to have, like, a really good image without necessarily being skilled or whatever. I'm not saying that he's not skilled. I'm just saying I can't... I can't really gauge... Uh, I can't really gauge what he does. Um, 292. Okay. All right, so I think we did that. So now we have the concept of this master. So we create a new thing from a network backing, and on network accesses, it'll do that. Now I can do init master VM. This callback is actually, it's not going to take a fuzz session. It's going to take a... A worker. Uh, self dot master VM. So we're gonna give mutable access to the master VM. Beautiful. Okay, now we can go into. We just need access to VM. All right. So check this out. So now in my test fuzzer, I'm gonna do this dot. Then I can use my fancy new routine. Um, init master VM. This is going to take the worker. This is the master VM state. So now this is going to give me mutable access where I can fuck up the master VM. So I, what I can do is I can say. Uh, worker.vm.guestregs.rip is equal to, that's rip. I'm just going to clobber rip, and that should work. Yes! It does. So now what I can do is I can say, um, pub fn worker self. This will return a worker. And this is going to uh, create a new fuzz. Actually, this is just going to be fuzz, man. Fuzz. This is. This doesn't return. Doesn't return. It's all it does. It's gonna be a uh, fuzz forever in a loop, resetting to the master state every fuzz case. So now I can do let worker is equal to a worker uh, from. Uh, from net, new from net, and this is going to be, we'll have from net, and then we'll also have a, create a new empty VM, uh, create a new, 
MTVM backed by a master. So this is uh, let me ret is equal to this. This is going to take an arc lock cell of a uh, worker A with a lock cell, which is, uh, this is actually just a lock cell of a self and a lock interrupts. So this is going to take master, uh, a new VM forked from a master. And then this will say sum master. We'll move that mark into here. Uh, the, we'll move that arc into here. And then we'll say network memory is none. And then we can do ret.vm.guest regs is equal to master dot. Oh, oh I don't want to have to get that lock every time I want to get those regs. Yeah, we might just slide those regs somewhere else. Yeah, I think I think that's what we're going to do is this will have master dot we're just going to do um Well, we're going to go this way. So we're going to say uh let me vm is equal to vm new user and then we're going to do uh, whoops then we're going to do a vm dot guest regs is equal to master dot lock dot hmm can you put the lock cell around a sub portion of the master uh, not in a clean way uh, if I did some like massive changes, yes. Yeah. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna actually have a copy of the registers because they're small. Although that hurts cache locality a bit. Ooh. Master lock, master dot lock dot vm dot guest regs. So that makes a copy. So this is uh creates a new vm with the masters guest registers as the current register states. And then this, um, uh, create the new VM referencing the master. Uh, from net, yeah, this is from master. Uh, we'll say like fork and I'll take a master. Okay, uh, 425. So this is going to do worker fork. Um, self dot master VM. Mm. You know, if I do my lifetimes correctly, I think I'm fine there where master doesn't have to be an arc. So we'll do that. A. The master, this will take a reference to a lock cell. And I don't think I have to be explicit there with the lifetime. I do. Okay. So then uh, 423 here, I'm going to do fork from this. And then loop. Four twenty four. Um found a worker. Oh, I got lock cell that, don't I? Lock cell new. Master VM. Master VM is a. Oh, we can arc it here. Oh, it doesn't matter. Lock cell worker. Um, lock interrupts. So 
So yeah, the Master of Yum States. Just locked. Lock that shit down. 14. Uh, we'll just mutable reference this. I think we're fine. Can't for appropriate lifetime. Due to conflicting retirement uh, requirements. Okay, so... 406. Um, yeah, we'll wrap it in a lock saw at the end. So we'll do this. What are we getting there? Master VM, this is lock cell, new, master. Okay, now we just have lifetime issues. We'll just say 424, um, fork. We could arc it and just make it real fucking easy. Um, I think I am going to arc it. Because it's really not that difficult for me to do that. Um, and it also will make it a little bit easier when I change. Eventually, I probably will have fuzz return. Or in some situations, I might have fuzz return. So this will allow me to uh, clone this. And then I just have to arc new this. Okay, 424. Consider borrowing here. Yep, fork no longer takes a ref. So now an arc. And we just move that right into there. Okay, so that builds. Nice. Uh, 416, remove this mute. Yep, technically, since we grab lock, we don't need it. Um, fuzz forever in a loop. So this is like print made fuzz worker new line. And then in my test fuzzer, we're going to init the master VM and then we'll just do session dot, and that doesn't need to be mute, session dot fuzz. That will put my core as a fuzz worker for that. So this should theoretically work. There we go, made fuzz worker. So all that process happens. Um. Okay. Nice. 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 Okay, so now we want to load that. Get the original memory state. Mm. Yeah, I don't want to have that master in a lock cell. I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back.
All right, so let's see what we can do here. Um, we're gonna need to make, yeah, so, uh, I architected myself into a hole. So, yeah, I kinda, I kinda fucked this up. So I can't, I can't have a lock cell on that because I need to be able to reset to the master very quickly. Um, I think, well, I can have a page cache. Like, I need to be able to very quickly reset. And to be able to very quickly reset, I need to get access to the original memory that was present at that page. And to do that, I need to get access to the master's memory state. Ah. I have my dirty page. I know what I need to reset. But then I have to go into the master. That's just going to be too lock heavy. And the master needs to be mutable so I can pull in memory from above it. But that's only for performance. It's not an actual requirement. I think we gotta get rid of this lock cell. And we're gonna we're just gonna have to design this in a way that we can get rid of that lock cell. And it's not gonna be it's not gonna be easy. Um which means that master will be that. This will just get the VM guest regs. That solves that problem, which is nice. And then 67 uh, states. Um, 67. So that's not a lock cell anymore. It's just an arc self. Since it was pretty uh, cool, but the APIC remap over the SMM stuff was crazy. So that Intel figured it out and patched it out. Oh yeah. Yeah, there's some like really cool stuff that you can do in that. Um. Okay. So we can't lock translate that. We just can't. Full stop. We cannot do that. When I clone this master master VM in the fuzz session, this is just the worker. This is just the original, uh, the original worker. Although we moved that into an arc, didn't we? Shit. Um, okay, I can put that in an arc. I'm going to use something in arc that I think exists, but I've never used before. We're going to arc new master. Okay, and then 418. Okay, we can't lock that, of course. And then we can't do mute on that because we don't have mutable access to that. So to get mutable access to that, we're going to use... um arc, and I think there's a way to get mute. If there are no other arc or weak pointers to the same allocation. Yeah. So I can do that. So here I can do uh, get mute unwrap, which should not fail because I pass in by self. Make this mute. Uh, it's associated function. That makes sense. Arc get mute on this. And we pass in a mutable reference to an existing arc. Okay. Master cannot borrow is mutable. Perfect. So that's at 201. So that fixed that problem. I've actually never used that before. That's really cool. But 
Since I'm passing this by ownership, there are no arcs to that. Well, I guess in theory you could, but it's, it's just basically not gonna happen. Um, do I use a capture device? I do not. Wonder if anyone has managed to physically dissect a processor and look at the microcode. Um, if they've like created the tooling uh, to be able to tell the paths taken, the side channel gets the microcode. Um, there's a lot of research that goes into that. I I don't think um, I don't think anyone has a complete understanding of microcode, but I think people have some understanding, a non-zero understanding. Okay, so at this stage, I return out, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're gonna make a uh, fn uh, get page self vatter vert adder option fizz adder, and this is uh, it gets the Page aligned backing physical address for the page aligned requested virtual address. Um, and this will nest into the master. So basically, we do this. So we're going to translate. And I think translate, here's what I'm gonna do in translate. It's gross, it's really gross. But dirty is the only thing that causes us to write. Everything else is stationary. So what I'm gonna do is, this is gonna be pub unsafe fn translate internal. Then I'm gonna have uh, pub fn translate, which will take a p fizz mem, which will take a self, Fizz mem mute p vatter vert adder, and this will return a option mapping, and this will call unsafe self dot trans translate internal uh, with dirty set to false, but fizz mem vatter and that okay. So this is translate, blah, 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 okay. And then we'll have another function called translate dirty. Son of a bitch. We got translate dirty. And then this will be mute self. And we'll just do this. And this will say, um, uh, uh, during the traversal, the cor corresponding bits will be set dirty and accessed. Okay, so then this will do self-translate int true. Okay, so this will fail to build because This should fail on page table, 307. Uh, Self-translate internal. I uh, will just say self.translate, we don't need this. Okay, what else? We got a couple more of these we gotta fix up. 426, we'll fix this one up. False, that means nothing. 611, false, that means nothing. Okay, 466. I guess I could have translate dirty and that takes a bool. Uh, we'll do that. This will take dirty. Okay, now if dirty is set to true, that. So now we have translate dirty. That takes a mute. Uh, unsafe 533. 
534. Oh, yeah, because we made all this unsafe. Oh, okay. I was like, why is this all not needing unsafe anymore? That makes sense. Okay, 463. So what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, self as const self as mute self, and then we'll translate it. Because <laughs> we know that doesn't mutate it. Expected two arguments, snapshot at app, translate. This one, so let's take translate dirty. And if right is set, then we will dirty the pages. Otherwise we won't, that, ex that requires mutable access. This one, however, will not require mutable access and we'll do the same thing here. Um, pmem. Page table. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, 236. Here, translate dirty. All right, so now we just got some problems up here. Uh, in net mapping, oh yeah, kernel source net mapping. Uh, 69, we gotta clean this up. This is just translate. Okay. 166. That's in snapshotted app. Okay. I think that's it. It's just a couple more of these. 166. Two arguments here. That's true. So we're gonna translate that. If we fail to translate it, now we're going to say, if we successfully translated it, then else um, when auditing code and you go kind of deep, do you still inspect functions that do stuff like hash? No. Uh, I actually skip things a lot by name. I just kind of go by intuition of what does what. So... I just, I skip through, I only read like the high level part and then I start de uh, digging deeper in. But uh, I think a lot of reversing is having a very good intuition of what you do not need to read. Okay, ridgepage.0 is the translation in that case. Otherwise, if we weren't able to translate the page to the requested level, then we don't want to say none, but this should build 222 master dot Yes, that's not master.translate. This is master.get page. Align batter. Okay, and then we're here we're just gonna assert assert that the self or vatter dot zero and OXFF is zero. Uh, uh, get page requires an aligned virtual address. I don't expect it to be used in any other situation. So this is a validate alignment. We're gonna then translate on whatever we're on. We'll translate the virtual address. We'll get the mapping. If there's a valid mapping, in this case, I actually only care about the page because I don't need the PTE. So if there is a valid page for this mapping, then we return out the physical address of the page. Otherwise, we return none. So this is close to working, but not quite. This doesn't handle nested, um, but this is should like kind of work. Made fuzz worker. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to add reset support. Um, it's going to be this. So this, this whole thing is basically the fuzz loop. Um, yeah, so we're just going to do this. We're going to whack this into here and I'm fucking scared. 
Eh. We're just gonna fuzz. We'll return a VM exit. So it'll run one fuzz case for now. Bam. Okay, expected VM exit. All right, yep, and that is just VM exit, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so I can return the VM exit that I got. Snapshots. Holy shit. All right, we got some problems, 447. Ooh, self, because this is not a worker. Yeah, you know what? This should go on worker. All this stuff. So on worker, we will have pub fn fuzz case mute self. This is perform a single fuzz case. Uh, perform a single, single, <laughs> sing, single fuzz case to completion. Wow, that looked like it was maybe close. Oh, it's not close at all. Uh, 80. It's not snapshot. This is master. And that's just dot vm dot regs. If I'm not mistaken... No field occurs on that. Let's see. Uh, we're gonna assert that self dot master is sum. Uh, we'll just do this. Let master is equal to self master as ref expect cannot fuzz without master. This is uh, make sure we have. Uh, this is get access to the master. Okay, then this is just master.vm.regs. Beautiful. All right, 83. Uh, oops, guest regs. Get the original guest registers. Ooh, I really don't want to have to translate out of the master. Um, any rule of thumb for that? Because I'm stuck in this audit pur purgatory where I don't know... Whether I should go deeper, go past. I mean, once you get past the like top level in the architecture of the program, you kind of have no option other than going deeper. It's typically the the flow. Fuck. Fuck. I can't do this in the same way that I was doing. We have to translate this off the master. Master dot. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think this is fine. This is acceptable. This is probably acceptable. This is probably acceptable. Master got get page for the address. Um, let page is equal to this. Expect dirtied page without master. That's technically when we'd want to unmap a page, but we're just going to do that for now. Then we're going to do the copy. Holy shit. We're making progress. Wow. Wow. Okay. I'm going to grab these statistics. We're almost done with the rearchitecture. All right, let's take a look. RNG. Put this on the top. That could that could totally go in a different module, but we'll just put it here for now. Don't tell anyone. Ah, oh, 258. Okay, we got all that code. All right, so now we just want a couple more things. We want to get the, uh, just a lot of these things we want. And we'll throw these into worker. Um,
random number generator seed, UDP and server address, local worker statistics merged into the, whatever I call it, the fuzz session. On an interval. Okay, 122 RNG. This is RNG, RNG new. Stats, statistics, default, um, sync, RDTSC of next sync. Okay, bye. Done. Memory, 176. Um, oh, that's that page. This is the Ridge page. And we wanna get mutable access to the original page. This will be a Ridge page. This will be a Ridge PSL. And then we'll do a Ridge PSL as pointer. Uh, I can't wait for the memory corruption when we find out we fucked this all up. No injection. 192 timeout. That's passed in here. Timeout option. U64. That's a timeout in microseconds. And we'll go to 235. Snapshot coverage. So this is not snapshot. So now we have to put in coverage. This. These are going to go into the fuzz session. All observed coverage information, global statistics, and then we'll have coverage is an AHT new, and we're almost done with the refactor. I, I, I can't wait as much as you can't, you guys can't wait. Stats, lock cell, new, statistics, default. Okay, 262 VM exit filter, you gotta add one of those. Snapshot 227, oh, that's gonna be on, um, we're not gonna have snapshot, this is the um, session. This is gonna be an arc to a fuzz session. Uh, the fuzz session this worker belongs to. Okay, then 106, fuzz session A, might have lifetime issues when we do that. 230, this is fuzz, uh, session coverage should exist. Session coverage. Refactoring is nail biting work, yeah. I just, ugh, we're so fucking close. This is session. VM exit filter. Okay, I'm actually gonna grab these. I want the same thing. Fuzz, fuzz case. From a single fuzz case, we have a timeout. We have an inject routine. We have a VM exit filter. Okay, workers missing session, 60, 68. Fuzz, uh, we nuked that, didn't we? Oh, that's, this is just a loop? Just, just for now? Ah, fuck it, we can just do nothing right now. I got rice cooking. We'll make we'll make food like when the rice is done we can throw that on the grill. I'm fucking starving. It's it's probably gonna jump down. It's probably only like twenty minutes. I didn't make too much, but I'm guessing we can just make more if we need to. All right, uh, session. 
session I need to pass in when I make a worker. All workers have a session, and thus we're gonna have the session, which is gonna arc fuzz session ref a beautiful session arc fuzz session a oh fuck yeah uh then this is just gonna have session oops is the session oh okay i see two more errors and a bunch of networking things. I'll comment this out. Only two more errors. From that here. This is. Ooh. That makes a net backing. We got some we got some circular dependencies. Oh fuck, man. You kidding me? I think we can make this work. I think we can make this work. Why for a roommate? I don't. Uh, I just have someone staying over. We're just making it through this shit together. Um, implying I could be married. Come on, <laughs> implying I I would go out and meet someone. Come on, guys. Y'all know better than that. Fuck. <sighs> Shit, I'm gonna have to... Well, session that makes a worker which refers to itself that's deep the <sighs> fuck How do I want to architect this? I can have it be a none and then I can fill it in in post. I have access to that field. I don't want to do it on session. Session is hot. The master on this is not hot. Master VM on the fuzz session doesn't need to be hot. Do I even need that? Yes, I do just for that one. Okay, so what that means is that the master here is an option. Oh, that's... Um, so this... The fuck? I call it master VM, don't I? This is going to be an option. And then we'll fill it in as none, and then give a reference to ourself, and then we'll fill it in. I think we can do that. It's gonna be it's gonna be some shit. Fork is easy. Uh, 655. So we need to make a fuzz session. The master is gonna be a none. Right? Let me session. Oh, we got to arc this. Oh, then we're going to have to clone and then we can't get mute. Fuck! Oh. 
Oh, shit. Oh my god, how am I gonna do this? Um... Otherwise I can have the workers optionally have a session where the master doesn't belong to a session. So I need to set those guest regs. Am I overthinking this? Can I make, can I rewrite from net to take a follow session immutably and put the worker it creates into the session? Yeah, I think that's probably the best, isn't it? Yeah, I think that might be best. Let's try it. Let me think about it. I've thought about it enough. If that takes a... That takes a... Then that's where the fuzz session gets created. That's kind of gross. If oh if I have it op if I have the option here. Optionally this master I can make optional and then that solves the or this session I can make optional. Um, hmm. Do I need a master in the fuzz session? I need it because that's an arc. I have to do Android development now. Feels bad, man. That's not too bad. Android's not. Uh, okay, Android development does suck. To be honest. <laughs> Fuck. I could have a special worker. Oh my god. I was not expecting this problem. I didn't even think about this session. I can just make section session optional and I can be filled in. But then everywhere that I access session is going to be slow. I mean, it's just an if, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Yeah, the, the issue is a circular reference. Uh, I can say none, but then I'm gonna have to unwrap that session wherever I use it, and I, I'm pretty sure I use that session to get access to coverage. Like, all these are going to have to be as ref on wraps. 
Mmm, I can get access to the session once. Never mind. Yeah, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. I can... I can get the ses session once. No problem. Yeah, I, I haven't been thinking this through, clearly. Okay. When we fork, we're definitely gonna have a session. So this will have a some session. Okay, so, 235. Uh, this is gonna be on session. All these are gonna be on session. And then here, we'll do let session is equal to self dot session as ref unwrap. This is, uh, get access to the session. This happens per fuzz case. Like, there's VM entries and shit that happen here. It's just no big deal. Okay, then here we'll do a, ooh. Um. How do I, can you impl on an arc thing? Can I do impl? Um, arc? No, I don't think I can. I don't think I can do this. Uh, fuzz session. A, but that's effectively what I want because I it needs to be an arc so I can clone it. Yeah, I can't do that here. Um, so, so fuzz will basically have to. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can't clone myself because I'm not an arc. I'm going to wrap this in an... Uh, I don't want to wrap that in an arc. I think this will take a uh, session arc self. And then we'll fork from session.clone. And then session... Massivium clone. Uh, 13. Oops. Fuzz associated function. That makes sense. So what we have to do is we have to arc this. When we're all done creating our session, then we can do fuzz session, fuzz session. This is fine, that will consume the one arc that we use. Uh, use alloc arc arc, sync arc. Don't sync the arc. Okay, oh, now, oh, now we got the good stuff. 232. Oh, you fucker. Um, we're just gonna do self.session.map x.clone.unwrap uh, as ref. Yeah. We can do as ref.unwrap.clone. That's gonna get a new arc, but it shatters that lifetime. Okay, inject, we're not hitting. Here we go, we'll call inject on self. And then worker, 673. Yep, so I'll make a new worker. And then we'll just do worker.fuzz. Um, I guess we'll take a, we'll just make a worker here. Uh, get a new worker for this fuzz session. Then we'll fork from the master, delete everything else. Um, I feel like I missed a print, didn't I? Yes. Okay, so this is worker. And now I can do let mute. Worker, and now I have 
an exclusive worker. And then I can do worker dot uh, fuzz. Fuzz case. Timeout sum 10 millis. And then we have an inject routine. Well, I think I just want the injection stuff to be global. And determined by the session, I think. Yeah, I think I'll have inject be a function that I pass in and the VM exit filter. Okay, so this will return a VM exit. And then we'll register those with the fuzz session. So when we make a fuzz session, so this is gonna be a fuzz case, and the timeout's gonna be registered to Care about baseball at all? I'm not familiar at all with baseball. We got a friend who's really into baseball though. I am not myself. Whoa. Okay, we fucked something up. Ah, uh, open. Bam. Okay, so now we got problems. So now we're gonna have an injection routine. Yes, 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 yes. Now we're getting to what the meat. The meat of it. Um, I think worker I'll extend by a T. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll do... Um, Okay, we got a fuzz session. This fuzz session is gonna have an inject callback. Inject callback, and this is optional. It may not exist. This is a callback to invoke uh, before every fuzz case when the, um, for the fuzzer to inject information into the uh, VM. Before every fuzz case, it'll call inject callback. We're gonna have a timeout. This is the uh, timeout for uh, each fuzz case. Hey Melante, how are, how are you doing? I'm doing quite well. We're just, we're doing some refactoring right now, which is never super fun. It's not the most thrilling. But we're almost done with it, and then we can start doing what I actually wanted to do, but I had to do this code anyways, and it's only been four hours, so we're, we are, we're not really too far into it. So we're going to do a mutable reference to a... Um, a worker. An FNA. No. Worker A. Inject callback. That's not the parameter I want to use for that. Um, can I do this? Because that's what I want. No, I can't. That makes sense. So I have to declare it there. Okay. Inject. Get rid of that. Timeout, 199. Compute the timeout. So before we start fuzzing, we're gonna do a um, session.timeout.map. Beautiful. Uh, 269 VM exit filter. Session VM exit filter. Uh, oh. Uh, if let sum VM exit filter is equal to this. 
uh, session VMX it filter. Then we will call the VMX it filter and we'll pass it uh, self reference and the VM exit reference. Okay, that's looking good. So then we'll have a do to do inject. Uh, we can do this one quick too. Uh, if let sum inject is equal to session inject, then we're going to pass that. Oops. Um, inject callback. Okay. Uh, 271 VM exit filter. And we'll do that. So. Down here, we'll have a VM exit filter option VM exit filter a um, callback to invoke when VM exits are hit uh, to allow a user to handle VM exits to re enter the VM. Okay, and then we'll do uh, VM exit. VM exit filter takes a mute worker and a reference to a VM exit. 272. Oh, expected bool. Yep, returns a bool. Whoo! 671. This is going to inject callback none. We'll just say inject. And VM exit filter none. Okay, 675. Oops. Uh, inject callback. It's just inject. This is just inject. Okay, 671 timeout. Um, timeout is none. Okay, and now we're going to um, set the timeout for the VMs in microseconds. Pub FN uh, timeout, mute self, timeouts, option U64, and then we'll just do um, self.timeout is equal to timeout self. So we're using the builder pattern here. Okay. Now we're going to do a uh, pub fn inject uh, mute self inject option inject callback. Eh, just don't set it if you're not going to use it. And honestly, this as well. It's just none by default. Okay. So set a injection callback self dot inject is some inject self. Oops. This is uh, set the injection callback routine. This will be invoked every time the uh, the VM is reset and a new fuzz case is about to begin. Okay. Then we're gonna have a VM exit filter. Um, S inject VM exit filter. Whoops. Uh, this is VM exit filter. This is uh, set the VM exit filter for the uh, fuzz uh, for the workers. This will be invoked on a an unhandled. VM exit and gives an opportunity for the uh, uh, fuzzer to handle a VM exit to allow re-entry into the VM. Um, just need some lifetimes now. Just sprinkle some lifetimes in here. These are kind of weird lifetimes, but we'll just sprinkle them in here. Okay, so now what I should be able to do is I will initialize the master VM. I will set a um, 
timeout to 10 milliseconds, I will set a um, inject callback, and this will be a, a function. Inject mute self, uh, oops, worker, mute worker. Something like that. So I'll take the inject routine and then uh, VM exit filter. Take a VM exit filter. Okay, FM VM exit filter, worker, mute worker, and then VM exit, which is a VM exit. This returns a bool, and we'll just say not handled for now. Quite frankly, in this fuzz case, in this fuzz worker, I don't think we're actually going to have VM exits, so we'll just get rid of that. Which means all VM exits will be unhandled. And then worker will pull in from here. And I think we'll need a lifetime for that. Oops. We do not. So this is print uh, inject for fuzz case. Um, oh, yeah, almost, almost got what we want. Okay, um, inject worker. Yep, not using that. Inject for fuzz case. So now I should be able to do this loop. Fuzz case. And so I made a worker, and I should just get spammed with inject for fuzz case. Nice. Now, what I'm going to do is one of these um, on fuzz session, I'm going to do um, uh, I guess... I want like a stat print, but I only want one of the cores to do a stat print. So, yeah, let's do this. Um, next status, option U64. All right, oh, this is uh, Atomic U64. This is the uh, RDTSE time to take, to print the next status message at, and then in fuzz, we're just gonna get that. We'll do like let next stat um, next status print. Next status is equal to session. Next status dot load ordering sequentially consistent. And this is a uh, get the time for the next status print. And we'll make that mute. And then we'll pull in Atomic U64. Use core sync atomic, atomic U64 in ordering. 678, next status. This is uh, Atomic U64 New Zero. Okay, then next status. When we go to fuzz, what we're gonna do is... Um, if CPU RDTSC is greater than or equal to the next status, I guess my RDTSCs aren't necessarily synced. So maybe I only want to do this on one of the cores. Like this would probably work, but it's not perfect. Um, I could designate one of the cores, the first one, as a printer. Yeah. All right. 
Uh, nix. Okay, we're gonna undo all that. Okay, and then we're gonna in worker. The first worker that we make, this is gonna be next status. And this is a uh, RDTSC timestamp to print the status message at. Okay, 674 fuzz session. Um, this is on struct worker. Okay, and then on fuzz session, I will have a num workers. That's an atomic U64. Uh, number of fuzz workers uh, registered. Not necessarily how many are running, but it is the number of fuzz workers. Fuzz. Workers is atomic U64 new zero, so we will need this at the top like we had Use core sync atomic atomic U64 ordering And then next stats it's gonna be an option and Then we'll set that on the first one 147 next stats For both of these, 687 num workers. Okay, and then down here, when I make a worker, I'm going to do session dot num workers uh, fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent. Uh, it's not just the strong reference count for session. It is. Well, they could theoretically make more. Okay, we'll just do this. Um, worker ID is equal to this. And then next stats. Yeah, this will just be a U64. And then worker ID is it zero. Uh, for the master, we'll just hit not zero. And then this will get a worker ID. Uh, worker ID U64. Fork. Okay, now this will take worker ID. Uh, 159, worker doesn't have this. No, it doesn't, does it? Worker ID. This is the sequentially allocated worker identifier. One thirty nine. Next stats is zero. Next stats is zero. Okay, 23, we're not using that. Next stats, 122, worker ID, not using that. Okay, now in fuzz case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, every time we VM exit, uh, let time, uh, cur RDTSC is RDTSC. We have to do it anyways for the timeout. Uh, cur RDTSC. And then we're gonna say, if self.worker ID is zero and cur rdtsc is greater than or equal to self next stats and we'll do self dot next stats is equal to time future one second and then this is just print stats <laughs> and then we'll get rid of this and this should in theory print stats every second
stats, stats, stats. Okay, but only one of the workers does it. Uh, so if we're worker ID, uh, print some statistics. And then here we'll get uh, fuzz cases is equal to session.stats. Um, actually, this is like global stats. Um, okay. I got stats. I think Gav's master race. Uh, this is DWM. Sorry to, sorry to not please you. If the current RDTSC is greater than or equal to the next statistics print, then we're going to get the stats is equal to session dot stats dot lock. Right. Um, get access to global statistics. At least I use them. Statistics, fuzz cases. Okay, we got VM exits and fuzz cases. So what we're gonna do is print fuzz cases, uh, cases 12, stats.fuzz cases, and then four VM exit frequency in stats.vm exits. We're gonna print the frequency uh, 12 on these as well, and then we'll print the VM exit reason. And that, and this is, um, uh, compute the next time to print stats. Okay, and just iter that. B tree map. Okay, so now we should see the statistics of why we exited in the fuzz cases. Okay, so we're exiting due to page fault. I actually want to hex print that. Um, but yeah, so now this is giving me information about what's going on. Okay. So, we're exiting due to this page fault, which is due to us setting up the master VM with a specific register state. So, here's where we do, like, one-time initialization of the VM. Here's where we do per fuzz case initialization. And here's where we just loop forever when we fuzz. <laughs> nice. So, let's get a printout of coverage. We can do that. All right. I'll actually be right back. I'm gonna make some dinner. I'll be I'll be away for like a while. I'll actually just restart streaming. So I'll be back when I'm uh, done with dinner. See y'all in a bit. <laughs> 